You are now listening to Chakras and Shotguns. Welcome back to Chakras and Shotguns, episode Dirty 30. I'm Mick. And I'm Jen. Welcome back. So how you doing? Oh, cha. It has been a week. Yes, indeed. It has been a long week. Um, Let's see. Kicking off, like we came back from vacation and we're like, cool, let's get into it. Happy Monday. Mm-hmm. And... Long story short, found out we had a gas leak, mm-hmm. not in the house, but like from the house to the main line. Am I saying that correct? That's correct. Okay. And it took five business days to fix. Yeah. So that part of the the line is in our yard. So it falls under our responsibility. So we had to hire a plumber to come out, replace yeah. the whole line. And there were several steps in the process where we had to get the city to approve the work that was done and inspected and everything. And then have the gas company come back out and test it and yada, yada, yada. But it took five days. So we didn't have hot water or heat in our house all week. And normally in Texas, heat is not that big of a deal. But we had like some pretty low days, like in the 30s. And we had to bundle our kids up. and yeah. Think about, are we going to a hotel? Are we going to go with family? And then it was just so complicated with the kids that we decided to stay in the house. So that had been an adventure. We also had guests coming in this weekend. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we had a lot of balls in the air. Lots going on per usual. But um, from a prepping standpoint, I think... um, We kind of talked about it because we have fail safes for electricity, like a standard like outage from a storm or whatever with the solar panels. But I guess we had never really thought through what would you do if your natural gas went out? Yeah. So that was an adventure. Um, Yeah, we have electric on our stove. So cooking wasn't an issue, but just like in general heating and having hot water. So basically our fail safe was we ended up boiling water on our stove, our electric stove, and taking that water into the bathtub so we could have warm water to bathe the girls and then pretty much just use electric space heaters in different spaces, in the girls' rooms, our room, or wherever we were working to kind of keep the, that space as warm as possible. Yeah. Now obviously there was a big fire in New York that was caused by a space heater. So we were a little cautious about how we were, you know, utilizing those, how long we kept them on. Definitely didn't want to have them on while we were sleeping. We were Uh, a lot of cautious. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Definitely. So we were like warming up the girls' rooms, like had the space heaters on high right up until the point they got in the bed. And then we turned them off. It was like hoping we would coast them through. (laughs) Basically. And it did. It worked out. I mean, I think at one point, It actually warmed back up, the weather did, so then we didn't even really need the space heater as much. It felt like a normal day. But, yeah, that was um, a lot going on. We also realized, like, oh, we could use the fireplace. Oh, wait, the fireplace is with gas. Exactly. So we just had to, like, think through all of those things and how we were going to do it and how we were going to navigate. Yeah. Oh. We also learned a lot about the circuitry of our house, right? figuring out where we can actually run space heaters and what would actually oh, yeah. flip the the uh, the circuit breaker um, into, like, you know, overload it, basically. Uh, so that was interesting to kind of navigate that and try to figure out, okay, like, if we put plug it in here, is that the right, you know, circuit that's also connected to the refrigerator? And is that going to be an issue? Oh, my um, gosh. So, yeah, it was fun navigating that. I'm like, it's cold. It's 30 degrees in the morning. You're trying to get kids ready for school. You want them to be warm. Because I guess as a parent, like, I, I'm i like, I can power through, but I don't want my kids to be cold, right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden the light shut off and the refrigerator's off and you're like, oh, God, what now? Mm-hmm. But thankfully we just needed to to flip that breaker. 
Mm-hmm. I did want to say, so that was like from a, a prepping standpoint. This was a very Shockers and Shotguns adventure because from a spiritual standpoint, Mick was just talking about how he never gets around to taking a sit-down bath in the bathtub. And guess what we had to do this week? <laughs> <laughs> we had, like, no choice. I think one day you did take a cold shower because you just, like, did not wait and wait on this pasta pot to boil. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, we did the salt and the whole nine. I did feel spiritually cleaner this week, which I definitely needed because this week was frustrating as hell. Yeah. And I started feeling that retrograde energy, too, because we had a bunch of miscommunications between the city and the plumbers and the gas company. And it was like, oh, we came by. We talked to somebody. You ain't talked to me. Mm -hmm. And so it was a lot of back and forth. So we needed a lot of woosah. Yeah. Energy grounded so we could navigate through this whole process. Yeah. And I had to get a little creative about kind of cleansing our space. I mentioned before how I like to say to the house once a week. But I didn't want to open the windows in the cold because we were trying to keep hot air in the house from the space heaters that we were generating. So I couldn't do my usual, you know, cleansing, you know, procedure to get the stale energy out of the house. Mm. It was a lot. It was a lot. Well, why don't we do a little breath work to kind of release some of that energy? (laughs) Let's get into it. I was... Actually, reconnecting with a friend of mine earlier this week, and we were talking about the things that drain us and the things that light us up, so to speak. And I guess when you say light us up, I feel like people think it's like, oh, it makes me like feel good. But I don't think we think about it energetically all the time. Or maybe I didn't like literally light us up electricity. I'm going with the theme here. Okay. Mm -hmm. And... Um, thinking about the things that, you know, this friend was feeling like her job wasn't lighting her up. And when I was reflecting on it, you also wonder if it's pulling from you. It might not be giving you energy, but it also might be draining you. And so I wanted to do the breath work for today of just like reclaiming that, like reclaiming our energy as our own, sitting in feelings that light us up. And drawing energy from within and setting intentions. Okay? So let's find a comfortable seat. Close your eyes. And we're going to take three deep cleansing breaths. Inhale in through your nose. Expanding your belly. And sigh it out through your mouth. Let's do that again. Inhale in through your nose. Feeling your seat rooted. Sitting up a little bit straighter. Hold at the top. And sigh it out through your mouth. Last one, inhale in through your nose. Feeling yourself expand. And this time, exhale out through your nose. So we're going to visualize ourselves as Beings of light. So we're going to visualize ourselves as a tree. And feel your roots going into the ground. And maybe these roots represent different things for you. Maybe there's a root going to work, a root to your children, to your partner, to your friends, to your family, 
to your passions. There may even be roots to trauma, the past, roots to worrying about the future. And I want you to assess which of those roots give you energy. When you think of them, even though there may be work involved, Your children, depending on how small they are, could require a lot from you. But do they light you up? I want you to reflect on the feelings that you're feeling about the things that bring you joy, that bring you passion. How does that feel in your body? Do you get goosebumps? Does a smile come to your face? Are you holding in a laugh about something that your uncle did last Thanksgiving? Just think about that. And then let's turn our attention to the things that maybe we feel don't give us energy. Maybe the things that even drain us. And what I don't want you to do is feel those feelings. But in this moment, affirm to yourself that you are reclaiming that energy to devote to the passions and the joys of your life. I want you to call that energy back into yourself and feel more energized in your body and focus on that feeling. If you're not already smiling, let's smile together as we appreciate and are thankful for this newfound energy that hopefully will carry us through the day. All right. Thanks, Jen. That was great. You're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) Let's jump into our main topic now. We've had a few prepping topics in the past, and we mostly kind of covered the basic things that you need. Today, though, I wanted to nerd out a little bit and talk about something that's like a little more of a deep cut in the prepping world, and that is electromagnetic pulses, also known as EMPs. Yes. So I'm going to just put a warning out there. This is going to be a ride. (laughs) Please don't, please don't run out and just freak out. But I, I've, I'm excited about getting into the topic. So what exactly is an EMP? It's a surge of electromagnetic energy, and it can be natural or man-made. Yeah, this surge of energy, it can disrupt communications and damage electrical equipment. So I'm a, I'm a Matrix stan, love the Matrix movies. And when I think about EMPs, the first thing that comes to mind is that all of the ships that were in the quote unquote real world, you know, they, they were the, the ships that were piloted by folks from Zion, they were all equipped with EMPs. And it was their only weapon against kind of the machines, the sentinels that would kind of come and try to hunt them down. And basically, you know, they had to make sure that every electrical device was off and that everybody was out of the matrix before they could use it to like stop the sentinels. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the first movie, right, they're like calling Neo to get back from the matrix so that they could use their EMP to uh, kill the the sentinels that were attacking the ship. You know, I've seen that movie so many times. <laughs> and I knew, I mean, I think I had like a working, it was context clues, let's be honest. Mm-hmm. 
Maybe I haven't seen it that many times. I know you've seen it probably a, at least a hundred more times than I have. Yes. Or a hundred times more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess it's like you understand like the urgency and they're like, come on, come on, Neo, come on. Yeah. But you don't like maybe know the science behind it mm-hmm. and the layman, yes. I would say. Yes, yes, yes. But yeah, Matrix, that's a good one. I think. That's the only pop culture reference I can think of with EMPs. Yes, yeah, that's a, a good thought. I, I can't think of any other other ones. I mean, other than like maybe some throwaway episode of Battlestar Galactica. I don't know if you like Battlestar Galactica. Never got into it. I didn't either. And I was mostly talking to the people that were listening. But <laughs> this was for my sci-fi nerds. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I feel like when you say electric device, people will think about, like, the lights in their house, though. And to be clear, an EMP can affect anything that can conduct electricity. So that includes cell phones, refrigerators, generators, inverters, get into those, TVs, radios, cars, etc. Certain cars. Mm-hmm. I think we said, like, what, like, post, like, roughly post-90s? Yeah, when they started adding, like, computer technology to to cars yeah so as i mentioned they can be natural or man-made so let's get into the natural ones one kind of natural emp can come from the sun and what is called a coronal mass ejection the sun occasionally will emit streams of plasma and if the stream is large enough it can actually send a wave of electromagnetic energy into our solar system fun (laughs) Yeah, so the most kind of well-known incident of this happened in 1859. It was a solar event known as the Carrington event. Uh, It was the most intense geomagnetic storm in recorded history. So think back to 1859. There's not a ton of electronic technology at that time. However, though, there were telegraph systems. And they actually sparked and caused quite a few fires. And telegraph operators reported receiving electric shocks. Hmm. These natural EMPs can also occur from meteoroids being broken up as they pass through Earth's atmosphere or even from lightning strikes. That kind of also sounds like don't look up. Have we talked about that on here yet? We have not. That's a that's a great thing to talk about. Uh, so if you guys haven't, checked out on netflix there's a movie called don't look up it's filled with like a ton of a-list actors right there's leonardo dicaprio there's, what was the budget i know right huge jennifer lawrence is in there Meryl streep you have jonah hill tyler perry like oh yeah tyler perry there's a ton of people in there um and basically the it's a satire it's about just about how like messaging and politics will compete with facts propaganda yeah great great movie i don't want to spoil it check it out moving on to man-made emps they can come from a few different sources so the most common that we deal with somewhat occasionally are power line surges and so that's why we have the basic surge protectors that we buy for our expensive tvs gaming systems etc computers you know you plug your electronics into those and you're protected against one of those power surges. Let's pour one out for my probably 10-pound Dell laptop that was lost. Oh, no. In like 2007. <laughs> power R- surge took R- it out? Power surge took it all the way out. I was in college. I was like, what am I going to do? The most worrisome man-made EMPs would be generated by a nuclear detonation. Ooh. That goes off above the surface of the Earth. Fantastic. Governments have known about this. Like, they've known that they can set off these EMPs since they started testing nuclear weapons as early as the 1940s. So in 1962, the U.S. carried out this test called the Starfish Prime Test, and they detonated a bomb 250 miles above the Pacific Ocean near Japan. When they detonated that bomb, it was felt almost a thousand miles away in Hawaii. So it's 250 miles up in the sky, and it was felt a, 
almost a thousand miles away in Hawaii. So they ended up writing it off because it was 1962. And in Hawaii, it was, you know, there wasn't a ton of electricity. You know, it wasn't, I would say, probably was more um, rural then. And it was like a few streetlights went out. But that was kind of a big deal to me that something that far away could impact it in that way, right? They also figured out that it actually matters where you are, like latitude and longitude and magnetic fields. So what they kind of figured out is if they had detonated that same bomb somewhere else, like over the continental United States, it could have been a really big problem. Yeah, I think one of the the main problems with those detonations is that the EMP effects actually take place across three different phases. And so these are often referred to as E1, E2, and E3 phases of an EMP. And there's a lot of scientific details about each phase that I won't bore you with, gamma rays, neutrons, etc. <laughs> but I will try to quickly summarize. So when that nuclear detonation happens in the atmosphere, the first phase is E1. It is a short and intense wave of high voltage energy. And that pretty much destroys computers and telecommunication equipment. I mean, you're talking like in a, a fraction of a second, this phase happens. And so it, it'll overwhelm those basic surge protectors that we have, our TVs and computers plugged into at home. Then you have E2. And that happens really quickly as well. It's about a second. And it's very similar to a lightning strike. Now, normally we'd be protected against kind of the equivalent energy of the E2 phase. So think, you know, our basic surge protectors, again, happening to protect us against lightning. But the problem is E2 occurs right after E1, which has already fried a lot of that equipment. So we're looking at another wave of damage. And then E3, it can last up to several hundred seconds, so a few minutes. So it's longer than the first two phases. And it's caused by the nuclear blast distorting the Earth's natural magnetic field. This phase is similar to what would happen in kind of the solar generated EMP scenario that we talked about before with the Carrington event. And this is when we'd worry about power line transformers getting wiped out. Mm, so the infrastructure. Exactly. So it's it's coming at you in these three huge waves. This is the problem that you mentioned would happen if there had been a detonation over the United States, right? Got these three waves of damage just kind of coming at you. So fun. So I've always thought to myself, if a war gets that bad where going nuclear is really an option, like that's an earth ending event, pretty much, or at least like earth devastating. Yeah. So it begs the question, like a nuclear bomb on land, is that really an option? Yeah, I mean, I think this is where the idea and the probability of an EMP threat becomes more real because you can detonate a nuclear weapon high above the land of your enemy, completely knock out their power grid and just kind of let chaos happen, right? It, it just seems like a, a tidier way to eliminate a superpower country that you have issue with without like irradiating the planet. And it must be tidy since they've been doing these tests for so long without dramatic side effects. I mean, that we know of. <laughs> Godzilla hadn't popped up yet. <laughs> exactly. Or has he? <laughs> <laughs> do, 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 do. Um, so I think preppers talk a lot about EMPs. There are many people that think an EMP will be what causes the doomsday scenario where society collapses. But let's kind of slow walk through this. What does an EMP look like? Yeah, let's go through an EMP scenario. So we'll do the United States because that's what we know. And let's say there's no real federal or state government that has like truly made an effort to protect the power grid from an EMP. So the entire power grid goes down like across the United States. Okay, well, no lights. Well, that's not that bad, you know, depending on the weather. Um, do we still have natural gas? Will that work? Um, we can always just light fires. 
But remember, it's also generators. Like for people who are like, oh, but I've been listening to Chakras and Shotguns. Mm -hmm. I bought a generator. I put solar panels on my house. All of that can be affected. Oh, I want to call my mama since it's dark and I, I ain't got nothing else to do. Can't watch Netflix. Oh, your cell phone's down. I've heard mixed things about landlines, but depending on like how your phone's wired, like I think most people have like, well, if you have a landline, you probably have like some type of wireless situation. So that could get messed mm-hmm. up. So you can't call anybody. Um, You can't go anywhere, most likely, because your car isn't working. And hopefully you weren't driving when the EMP hit, because I don't know how that all works. Yeah, if you have like an electronic braking system, I'm, I'm, I don't know, obviously, but that could potentially be affected. Right. Do you slowly like? Is it kind of like when you run out of gas and it's just like clock, 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 clock and you kind of just, <laughs> you kind of just stop, or do you just like I hold don't on? Don't live in like San Francisco where you like coming down a hill or something. Oh Lord. <laughs> So that's kind of that's kind of terrifying. Like you can't drive for resources. You could be stranded somewhere. You can't call anybody. There's no lights. You're going. It could be winter time. There's no heat. What else? If you need life saving medical equipment, like there are people who are on dialysis machines or um, some other equipment, oxygen tanks, I guess, you know, or oxygen type breathing machines, yeah. anything like that, it doesn't work. If you need insulin, the labs can't make it. Any type of life saving medication, anything that needs to be refrigerated, that's out. You can't use any of that. Hospitals, they're done. Like they can't operate. What if they were operating on somebody? Like that's out. What else? Internet goes down. So all of the electronic records are gone. Bank accounts. So nobody has any money. I mean, there's also no student loans. So mm-hmm. this might be like the the master leveling of the playing field. But, you know, now who owns your house? Who says that you can live where you're living? Who are you? You know what I mean? Like all of the records are gone. Mm. I mean, okay. I I know what I know what my, my response would be. Come and take it. <laughs> well, there is that. But if it also if we're talking about the E1, the E2, the E3 and the power transformers are down. And, you know, all of that, like, this is going to, this isn't going to be like an hour or two. Like, oh, I was without student loans for an hour or two and they had the backup in Switzerland or something. They probably do have the backup somewhere overseas. But just for the sake of the argument, there's no backups. No, this is probably going to take days, weeks, months. Some even say, like, it could be a year and a half minimum. Like, there's different opinions on how long it would take to get something like that back up. Oh, the last one that I wanted to say was we saw in the 2021 storm here in Texas, which was really, really surprising. It was like, oh, we have no lights. And then it became, oh, neither does the water treatment plant. So you don't have safe water to drink either. And so you see how it's just kind of like a domino effect, particularly when it comes to basically the things that we pipe into our home. I think that's like one of our biggest takeaways from this whole gas line thing we've been experiencing is that the things that you pipe into your home are a lot more fragile than we really think. Like there's so much, and and I think they make us a lot more fragile because there is such creature comforts. We're so used to, I paid a bill and this stuff is on, Right. So no cars, no electricity, maybe no potable water. Back in the dark ages, now that I've properly scared everybody, how worried should we really be about EMPs? And is this something that can happen, like, tomorrow? Yeah, this is an interesting question. I think starting first with the coronal mass ejections from the sun. These solar events are are pretty rare. As I mentioned before, the last major one happened in 1859, so you're talking 150 years ago. There was, however, a research paper that I saw created by an assistant professor 
at UC Irvine named Sangeetha Abdu Gioti. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. In the paper, it was estimated that the probability of a solar storm affecting Earth is between 1 and 12% per decade. So that's like a pretty big range, one, but it's not like definite, right? In terms of 12% being the highest that it happens in a given decade. Also, according to the research paper, Earth would have about 13 hours to prepare for the arrival of one of these solar coronal mass ejections. So you'd have a little bit of time to prepare. Mm. One thing I saw that was pretty cool is that there are space meteorologists. Okay. So it's not as, like, I think, you know, meteorology for the Earth has been, you know, it's pretty advanced. Like, I think, like, they can predict with pretty good accuracy what's going to happen. Like, you know, they've, and they've had it, multiple iterations of this. Mm-hmm. So I think it's like something a little bit more new, like the technology is still trying to catch up. Like I think the better it gets, that 13 hours becomes more time. Fair. Which would hopefully help. <laughs> I guess I'm thinking, what if like it starts and like I just went to bed? So I didn't lost like eight hours. Oh, no. So now I wake up and I'm like, oh, shit, I got five hours to figure this out. You know, for most people, it might not make that much of a difference. <laughs> okay. Especially if they're not listening to Chakras and Chakras. <laughs> fair, fair, fair. <laughs> so I think that covers kind of that solar-generated EMP scenario. So in the case of a man-made EMP, as Jen mentioned before, I think the most likely scenario is that, you know, in the U.S., we're concerned with the hostile nation detonating a nuclear weapon directly above the U.S., And that's really hard to determine, like, the probability of this happening. You know, lots of factors like our level of intelligence in some of these potentially hostile nations could affect that. So no one really knows a solid probability. But we do know that there are nations that certainly have the capability to take down the U.S. electrical grid with an EMP. Forbes published an article back in June of 2020 by James Conka that detailed China's specific capabilities. And so we'll link to the full article. But the key paragraph that stood out to me was, China has built a network of satellites, high-speed missiles, and super electromagnetic pulse weapons that could melt down our electric grid, fry critical communications, and even take out the ability of our aircraft carrier groups to respond. And even beyond China, I guess, like, the other countries that come to mind, like, top of mind would probably be Russia and North Korea as posing potential threats. Like, that's what I'm talking about. North Korea, which one is it? Kim Jong-il? Uh, Un, I I think it's... Il was his daddy. Yeah. Mm. You know, he likes to have these parades Mm -hmm. with these weapons, and it's very Sheree Whitfield. Who gonna check me, boo? (laughs) And, yeah, yeah it's um, disconcerting, to say the least. Yeah. Um, and if you were paying attention, like, even if you weren't in Texas, I'm sure it might have even been international news. It was such a such a big deal. Like, when that storm hit Texas, it very much revealed to everybody that our electric, our electric grid is... Bang, bang. Yeah. It's real trash. And if you follow politics since like 2017 and maybe even before that, it was like infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. Well, in the Obama administration, too, like they Mm -hmm. were talking about how bridges just be like falling and collapsing. Mm -hmm. Everything is just falling apart and we're not investing Mm -hmm. in the infrastructure of this country. And so it's kind of like. Yeah. Is it really obscene to even think that something like this could happen? And would it even be that difficult? Is it kind of like, you know, where you like flick it and it just like completely falls apart? Like basically are we like it's a house of cards? Yeah. I mean, I think that's that's a good segue. I did some reading about what the government is actually doing to try to anticipate or prepare for an EMP strike. 
So actually, in 2019, President Trump issued an executive order that advised several different government agencies with all these acronyms to assess and address key infrastructure that may be vulnerable to EMPs. And so in September of 2020, the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, released a program status report that provided updates on what has been done. So I kind of read through the report. Unfortunately, it was a lot of big words and not really any concrete details, kind of a nothing burger. It basically said they were reviewing the biggest vulnerabilities and assessing potential solutions along with FEMA and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, which I didn't even know was an agency. And yeah, it's been about a year and a half since that report was released. So I'm hopeful that we have made some progress and actually done some things. So yeah, that's kind of where the government is with that. I probably say that this might be the first time that I was actually impressed with something that the Trump administration did. Nobody better quote me on this. <laughs> but I do wonder, because come on, he doesn't do anything for like, you know, the good of the country <laughs> and because it's prudent and because it would have like made the country's infrastructure that much better. So I'm like wondering what the political play was. Like, who was it? Like, somebody must have, somebody, I was going to say some nut, but this is important. Somebody must have like donated and been like, I need this executive order to go through. Well, yeah, I'm sure there's a contractor who benefits to be able to go in and do uh, some of these, you know, these upgrades to the infrastructure, you know, follow the money. That money, honey. But, you know, if that money that contractor is able to actually do the work to protect our system, you know, whatever. I think my takeaway from it, from their report, not that I read it, I let Mick read it for me and summarize it. But, um, and y'all just heard it, it was nothing. My takeaway is they were like, oh shit, let's get on it, but don't tell nobody. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that they're working on it and they're not telling anybody. But, you know, hopefully, hopefully we won't see. I was about to say, hope we'll see, but hopefully we, <laughs> hopefully we won't see one way or the other. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's no news is good news situation. Uh, if you don't want to rely purely on the government and whatever they're doing, there are some measures that you can take at home. So the first thing we'll talk about is a device called the EMP Shield. The EMP Shield is basically a really fast acting surge protector, and it attaches directly to your circuit breaker. So it'll protect your house or car. They actually have a car model from lightning strikes in all phases of an EMP attack. So those E1, E2, E3 would basically, you know, survive E1, protect you against E2, and protect you against E3. So you can find these on empshield.com. I've done some searches, and they appear to be like the only brand on the market with this type of product. They've done a ton of testing, and they're actually even partnering with the Department of Homeland Security to provide devices for key infrastructure. So they may have gotten some money from that executive order to hey. help out. The home system runs around $399 and the car system is $389 right now. They're doing this New Year sale. So those, that's the sale prices. You can even find promo codes online. So just do some Google searches, EMP Shield promo code. And there's a few different people who like have other podcasts or blogs or whatever, and they partner with EMP Shield and you know you can get $50 off if you use like their promo code. So I use that. Uh, we purchased one and got that 50, 50 bucks off. You need to hire an electrician to install it. It's pretty complicated. It's not something I would try to DIY unless you like. Are, are an electrician. <laughs> yeah, unless you are an electrician, <laughs> you know, have a degree in electrical engineering or something. Um, so yeah, I didn't attempt to DIY it. I, I went ahead and hired someone. How many hours do you think that took for them? I feel like they were... To install it? Mm -hmm. It was like an hour. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like an hour worth of their time is yeah. probably worth five of yours. Yeah. So another way to shield your devices is what's called a Faraday cage. And that's like, it's not like a brand. It's like scientific. It's named after the scientist named Faraday. Yeah. 
And a Faraday cage or shield is some sort of enclosure that blocks out all electromagnetic fields. And some people will do this for their garage so their cars are protected, especially if you have a Tesla. Um, That would be, or I guess a Prius, blue. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, look, an aside. I have an irrational hate for Priuses. Priuses? Pri... I don't know. We'll go Priuses. Priuses. I have an irrational hate for them. They're slow. I got places <laughs> to be. Why are they slow? I don't know. I drove a Prius, like I rented one recently. It was fine. When? When I went to L.A. Oh. Yeah, I would have been upset if I was with you. <laughs> Because I hate Priuses. They're slow. They don't know where they're going. They can't ever make a turn. The light turns green. It might as well still be red. They don't move. <laughs> One man's trash is another man's treasure. Because I was praying after I got that Prius. Because you know how much gas costs in L.A.? I went all over the city. I think I spent $15 in gas. Because you were driving slowly. <laughs> That's why. Gosh, they're trash. I hate them. I just hate them. They don't drive well. I feel like the people who drive Priuses also don't know how to use their signal lights. It's just a very irrational stereotype that I have. I apologize to all the Prius owners that may be listening to this. This shade is not not deserved. I would also like to apologize to all the Prius owners that are listening to this, that you are driving such a trash car. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, and I'm back. You can DIY a Faraday cage, like, for your house or for your garage, but it'll look a little cuckoo. Like, I'm, it's like Reynolds Wrap and, like, Metal Mesh, but, like, there's plenty of online tutorials that you can do. I think, like, I think someone said, like, that's, um like, people wearing tinfoil hats, like, people going crazy and being like, the world is ending, and they got foil on their head. It comes from, like... Fear of this, like Faraday, like... Wow, I never thought about that. Then it's all about, like, <laughs> keeping yourself from receiving electromagnetic waves. There's also some other things about, like, it's, like, not about EMPs, but I think about, like, people listening in. I think, like, I think like, um, like the CIA and the NSA and stuff, they can't listen in as well if you're in a Faraday cage. Got it. So, you know, you see the movies and they're like, they're they're listening to me and they're listening to my conversations. I think it prevents electromagnetic waves from getting in or out. I'm trying to think, like, in Enemy of the State, did Gene Hackman's house have that? Baby, I don't know that movie like that. Oh, okay. Well, you know, the premise, right? Will Smith was like... Yes. He was like a wanted man. And he, broad strokes, broad strokes. He ran up on Gene Hackman's house and Gene Hackman was like, don't come up my house with, with this bull and... Was Tommy Lee Jones in it? I think Tommy Lee Jones was chasing Will Smith. Yes, yeah. yes. Anyway, never mind. There was another movie, Red Notice, I believe. John Malkovich's character was a little cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Mm -hmm. And I think he was kind of in that type of situation, like a bunker type situation. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of... But, I mean, there's a lot of abilities and technology for electromagnetic waves that can, like, boost signals. Some people have them, actually. Um, I don't know if you heard about people being able to hack your garage, like, remotely. Mm -hmm. And, like, figure that out. Like, a Faraday cage would probably prevent them from doing it. Got it. Because they couldn't, like, the waves could not connect with the garage. They're, like, power amplifiers. Got they were it. also, like, stealing people's Teslas like that. Got it. And so some people have them just like to protect their stuff. Hmm. Okay. That's like the next level prepping. Yeah. It depends on what you're prepping for. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm thinking about me and like my, like, you know, got your water, you got your food. Like that's like the next. Yeah. Getting a whole Faraday cage. Yeah. Getting a whole Faraday cage like a, or like building one into your house. I feel that's, like it would be very expensive. That's next level. That's what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. Doing it for your garage even. Um. But how, okay, this is going to sound bad. But, like, how boss would that be if, it, like, everything shut down and nobody got a car and you whipping around town? You might get shot. You need to have your gun with you. Oh, that's true. Damn. Remember when, what's his name? Alan? Who was it? Walking Dead, season one. Showed up in the red convertible. Oh, yeah, that was, um. What's his name? It wasn't Alan. No, his name wasn't Alan. 
No. He was with Maggie. Mm-hmm. Maggie and... Glenn. Glenn. Why did I say Alan? <laughs> I don't know. Wow. I'm somebody's mom. Anyways, we'll, <laughs> we'll drop a link to some interesting articles and videos that we have found out there. A cheaper way, a much cheaper way to shield your devices. You can find Faraday shield bags on Amazon. So you can keep a cell phone or a small radio or whatever super important device that you may need. Um, I think those are pretty cool. When I thought about it, but if you put your cell phone in there and it was like a real legit EMP, who are you going to call? Ghostbusters? Yeah, but I mean, maybe your cell phone has some like notes and things on it that you want to be able to access. Maybe your prepping notes are on your Mm -hmm. phone and you need to access them. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. Because when I did think about this, and it was like, if I was really going to the dark ages, you can't Google anything. You can't Google, like, how to make a tourniquet Mm -hmm. or how to grow lavender. Mm -hmm. You got to have hard copies. Maybe you downloaded some Netflix episodes offline mode on your phone. (laughs) At least you have a little entertainment, you know. That's all you're going to have forever. Just watching the same thing over and over. It's like I got to hit up half price books now. Yeah. Just to get some resources. Or, you know, our parents still have our encyclopedias. So I guess we'll just go to, go to them. Uh, well, one great thing that you could put in a Faraday shield, like if you were really trying to prepare for an EMP, would be a set of walkie talkies or a couple of sets. So you can keep in contact with your unit, your people, your family, whatever. Um, they do make shielded tents that's cool that you can park like a whole car in i didn't know that yes but um i do like to i do like to give the listeners prices on these things but when i try to get a price it said get a quote and so they want that money (laughs) (laughs) it was like oh request a quote i was like nah request these i'm i'm going (laughs) i think you should also consider having some devices that could withstand an EMP. So think like analog. You want to make sure you have like a basic manual can opener, a camp stove, a hand crank radio. These are things that we've mentioned before with other prepping topics. So if you want to go back and listen to like our episode on power outages and bug out bags, think about some of those items that we mentioned in the scenario of an EMP, would they withstand? Maybe you might want to have a couple of those things. You know, two is one, one is none, thinking back to that prepping rule. Mm. Yeah. So from there, I mean, we walked through like basically everything that could go bad and I guess how to basically shield it. But from there, depending on how you've prepped, you know, you're talking about bug out bags. It really becomes a question of do you bug out or do you hunker down? And and were you at home even when it happened? So the it's a little doomsday. and. The more I think about this, the more I get a little bit more freaked out. But I do think that it stretches your creativity when it comes to, like, planning for your survival. Are your preps assuming that you'll have electricity or gas? Do you, you know, to mixed point, do you have a camping stove or fireplace where you could even heat water? Do you have water storage, rainwater collection? So, you know, thinking of... I think sometimes we're like, oh, let me plan for or tornado and Mm -hmm. the lights go out. And that's great. And that's a great place to start where you're planning for an ice storm or, you know, you're you're planning for weather. I think, you know, adding an EMP on top of that when you're starting to think through how you would make it through a certain event. um, I think it just kind of pushes you more to like really, really think about everything that we really take for granted yeah. and expect to work when we expect it to work and what we would do without it. Like, how could you pivot? Yeah. I'll just say, if this is your first time hearing one of our prepping episodes, don't freak out too much. This is a lower probability event. Mm-hmm. As we mentioned, 1% to 12% chance of a solar EMP happening and a pretty low probability that a hostile nation would attack us and you know we do have a pretty well-funded 
defense department that's constantly looking at intelligence reports to try to figure out what these potential nations might be doing. So again, overall low percentage. So I wouldn't run out and go buy a bunch of EMP shields if this is like your first step into prepping. Go back, start with the basics, think about food, water, shelter, power first. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to take it to the next level and just kind of be the ultimate Boy Scout, Girl Scout, yeah, who is prepared for anything, you can step it up and start thinking about EMPs. Before I really get off task and start thinking about Girl Scout cookies now, I did want to say that as you're going back and listening to those, like, don't get, I would strongly encourage you not to get overwhelmed and just be like, I have to have rainwater collection and I have to have this and I have to have that. It's like, you cannot plan for this. Unless, like, I mean, you're a multimillionaire, you probably could. You probably could give it to your assistant to go handle, but <laughs> you can't get every single thing that you need and get comfortable with it and know your way around it and mm -hmm. know like what you're doing and how everything works. You're not going to be able to do it overnight. I would start small. Just think through it and don't think through everything. Think through water. Just like start with one thing and then move on from there. And I think thinking through it means something like that is an important step because, you know, as we saw with the pandemic, a lot of people weren't thinking through anything mm -mm. Um, because we I mean, we're just used to what we're used to. And the thought of, you know, not being able to get something from the grocery store or not even being able to go to the grocery store or being stuck at home just was not something that anyone had ever really thought about. Not a layman, maybe somebody at the CDC. So, you know, just give yourself grace that at least you're starting to think through planning for yourself and your loved ones. Back to my Girl Scouts aside, though, I heard these Girl Scout cookies are on DoorDash. That's dope. But then I got a little irritated because you ain't even got to hunt for the Girl Scouts no more. You ain't got to, your mama don't have to know nobody. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to be like, oh, it's MLK weekend. Let me go to Walmart. Maybe they sitting out there. I can give me some Thin Mints. Nothing. It's just on to me. Did you sell Girl Scout cookies back in the day? Absolutely. So you don't feel a way about the girls not working for this money? No, I I am an advocate of evolution. <laughs> Look, I wish somebody would be mad that I had a TI-83 plus and I wasn't counting on an abacus, okay? <laughs> the world moves on. But who gets the credit for the Girl Scout cookie if it's sold on DoorDash? like Girl Scouts. It just comes directly from the Girl Scout Big in dis cash. distribution center? Like, does a, does a particular scout get credit for the sale? Like, you know no, what I'm saying? No, no scout's getting credit for that sale. That's through the Girl Scout organization. They have signed an agreement with DoorDash. Got it. So yeah. the girls don't. I thought y'all, like, got prizes and stuff for, like, sales. We did. Sales. We did. I never sold enough. Got it. So nobody's getting credit for those sales? No. Nobody. That's sad. I wonder, yeah, I wonder what they're doing. But you know what? I'm glad the girls are sitting now, sitting at home. <laughs> I don't want them going door to door. No, you're right. I mean, it's a Where pandemic. Where the panorama? You're right. you're right. You're right. Plus, they are. But now I really want at least a tree foil. Or a shortbread, depending like on where you're from. Whatever, whatever. whatever. They're called tree foils in Dallas, okay? That sounds you terrible. You take that Houston ish on. A tree foil? That a just, tree foil. That sounds disgusting. <laughs> it's the symbol that's on the shortbread. Oh. If you were a Girl Scout, you would know. I was a wee below. Rank in Boy Scouts. A wee below. Oh my gosh. Now I'm running through the Girl Scout pledge in my head. And bank to propaganda, the propaganda was heavy. On my honor, I will try to serve God in my country. It says, what? <laughs> I'm six. Why am I signed up for this? They started that in World War II. Like, <laughs> you better get your Rosie the Riveter ass over there and serve this country. <laughs> Not Rosie the Riveter. Oh, my gosh. The indoctrination. <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to get out of here. <laughs> As always, if you have a question, shoot us a DM on Instagram or in our email box, chakrasandshotguns at gmail.com. Check out our website, chakrasandshotguns.com, where you can find merch 
And you can also support us by joining our community on Patreon. And finally, if you're loving the show, please subscribe and give us a five-star rating. Spotify just recently added ratings and reviews, so give us a five-star rating there as well. Thanks, guys. Namaste. Namaste.